Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. Previously on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Like a lot of children, Pauline Dakin's family moved a few times as she was growing up. She made new friends, but it was always sad to say goodbye when they needed a move again. When she asked her mother why they were moving, all her mother would say is that she'd explain when Pauline was older. Eventually, her mother did explain, and it turned Pauline's world upside down. So who is Pauline Dakin? What did her mother reveal? And what was the real reason her family was moving around the country? Pauline Dakin had a very strange childhood. Her mother did a lot of very strange things whose significance could only be understood in hindsight. What Ruth and Reverend Sears told her when she was 23 made sense of and explained all the bizarre things, but there were even more bizarre things yet to come. listening to episode 163 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Pauline Dakin and the weird world. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Be sure to stick around, folks, for the end of the episode, as we'll have your feedback on our recent episode on Drop Bears. Don't want to miss that. But first. In 1988, Pauline Dakin's mother finally revealed to her why she'd had such a bizarre childhood. She said Pauline's father, Warren, was a mobster, and she and a family they were friends with had become the targets of organized crime. This explains so many of the bizarre experiences in Pauline's childhood, but there would be much, much more to the story. What Pauline had learned was only the beginning. So what did Pauline learn next? What mind-bending revelations were still to come? And how would Pauline react? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what do we need to say this episode before we begin? Last episode, we mentioned that although there's nothing graphic or violent in this story, that some of its psychological themes could be disturbing for particularly small or sensitive children. We're past that for the most part, but parents should still listen and make decisions for their families. All right. So where were we in Pauline's story at the end of last week's episode? We were in February of 1988 when Pauline's mother, Ruth, had arranged a clandestine meeting with her in a motel room. At this point in her life, Pauline was 23 years old. She was working as a journalist and she was engaged to be married to a man named Terry. In the motel room, Ruth and family friend Reverend Stan Sears of Canada's United Church told Pauline the real reason so many bizarre things had happened in her childhood. Both families, the Dakins and the Searses, they said, had been targets of multiple mob threats. But they had the benefit of being protected by an elite anti-organized crime task force that reported directly to the Queen's Privy Council of Canada. Still, this protection could only be partial as they were living out in normal society rather than in a special witness protection program enclave. As a result, it had been necessary for the Dakins and the Searses to keep many facts about their families private, to periodically change their plans, and even to move across the country more than once. None of this could be explained to Pauline and her little brother Ted when they were children as they might accidentally let things slip and they could get back to the mob bosses who were after them. But now that Pauline was an adult, she could finally be told. But the mind-bending revelations had only just begun. So what did Pauline think of what Reverend Stan and her mother were telling her? It was a lot to take in, but she knew they were both persons of extreme integrity, Pauline had come to regard Stan Sears as a surrogate father. She even called him Papa. 
In her biography, Pauline writes, I thought back along the years I had known Stan. Camping trips where he'd spent hours with Ted and me, showing us how to plug a crab apple on the end of a sharpened stick, take up our best major league batter stance and fling the fruit into the river. I thought of the times as a teenager when I'd been angry with my mother, rebelling and acting out, and he'd been the buffer, listening to me rant about her, vent my rage, and then, in his calming, reasonable voice, mediating between us. He never simply took her side. He was my advocate, too. I thought about his public life as a minister. He'd taken on unpopular causes, fearless in defending and supporting the poor, the homeless, the indigent, and addicted. One December, when I was still in university and working part-time at the newspaper, the editor-in-chief had called me into his office. This Stan Sears, he said, you know him, right? Your family goes to his church? I acknowledged we did. He said he was concerned that Stan was publicly complaining about a Christmas program the newspaper was sponsoring to gather toys for poor kids in the city. The next time I saw Stan, I asked him about it. He said he'd seen some of the collected toys, and they were hard-used cast-offs. Those children, who had nothing, should receive new toys for Christmas just like more fortunate kids, he said. They were children. It was Christmas. Stan had shown himself over and over in my life to be courageous and honest, caring, and principled. So Stan was a generous man who had a reputation for standing up for the disadvantaged and making sure other people didn't take advantage of them. He wanted to make sure that even poor children got good toys for Christmas. Meanwhile, her own mother, Ruth, was scrupulously honest. My younger brother, Ted, and I had always teased her about what we called her extreme honesty. When the cashier at the grocery store gave her too much change, she gave it back. She said cheating on her taxes, even a little bit, and even if you didn't get caught, was wrong. When 10-year-old Ted had charmed the owner of the local hardware store into giving him a geranium plant, which Ted in turn gave to mom for Mother's Day, she'd made him go back and pay for it, out of his allowance. She wouldn't tell my friends I wasn't home if they called, and I didn't want to talk to them. What we tried to sell her as innocent white lies, she saw as the slippery slope. What else did Ruth and Reverend Sears tell Pauline? They told her more about what the secret anti-organized crime task force was doing. In fact, Stan had a hidden receiver in the lining of his wallet, and it vibrated when the agents wanted to send him a message. This device was kind of like a Morse code pager. In this day, in the 1980s, cell phones were still the size of huge, enormous bricks, so Stan's pocket device didn't allow for direct voice communication. And even pagers of the day could only carry super short messages like a phone number, which wouldn't be convenient if he wasn't near a phone. So what the device did was vibrate with pulses in some kind of code, rather like Morse code, but not exactly that. And then Stan would write down the message on a notepad and decode it. Why wouldn't they just use Morse code? Well, if for no other reason, I'd guess because it was too commonly known. It's the single most common code in the world. And if you don't want criminals doing electronic snooping, knowing exactly what you're saying, you'd better use something other than Morse. Stan's pocket device also was the subject of some good-natured humor among the group. Stan joked about it as his ear on his butt, and Pauline came to refer to it as his butt receiver. <laughs> so what sort of messages did they send him? Pauline asked him exactly that question. What kinds of things do they tell you? He paused as if trying to decide whether to tell me. After a moment, he listed types of messages. Trouble coming. Someone following you get to a busy public place, don't go out, and other operational messages he didn't elaborate further. Needless to say, that made Pauline kind of nervous. The idea that he was being followed and sometimes was told to get to a public place or not to leave his current location. How did Stan's wife Sybil take all that? She knew about the danger he was sometimes in, and it was significant enough that he'd taken a rather dramatic step to protect her. Stan explained that for his safety and for the safety of Sybil, he'd gone to live in a remote, secret community with a technology and security staff to ensure it remained hidden from organized crime figures and their enforcers. Stan only ventured out of the remote secret community occasionally, like when he came to help Pauline's mother explain about her childhood. Most of the time, he lived in what amounted to a dual-purpose, government-run community. One of its purposes was witness protection, like the federal witness protection program here in the U.S. Here, we have people change identities, move, and live out in the open. 
but the Canadian Anti-Organized Crime Task Force was taking a different approach. They apparently felt that they could better protect people if they were all together in a secret location that they could monitor constantly. And you could see how that would make it easier for them to spot intruders in town and protect the citizens. With the American approach, if someone in the witness protection program had their cover blown, they'd be vulnerable out in the general population without government agents watching them. What Stan had done by going to live in the village witness protection program was known as going inside. Anyone who went to live in one of the secret villages was said to have gone inside. Were there other differences in how the Canadian task force approached the issue of witness protection? One is that they had agents out in the community keeping an eye on the potential organized crime victims. In fact, there had been agents keeping an eye on Pauline's family the whole time she had been growing up, though she and her brother Ted hadn't been told about them up to this point because they were too young. This strategy could have some advantages, including letting the agents keep the witnesses safe without alarming small children by a constant visible presence around them, And since the agents were undercover, they could observe and catch the people who posed a threat to the family. You said the community where Stan was living had a dual purpose. What was its other purpose? It also had a special prison for people who had been part of the organized crime families that the task force was targeting and had caught. And by the way, they had a nickname for the organizations they were targeting. They called them The O. O for organized crime. And how many people lived in Stan's community? And where was it? He said that there were a few hundred people there, so it was a really small place. And there actually were several such communities around Canada. The one Stan lived in was located in a valley between two mountains, making it easier to hide and defend. And it was located somewhere near Hope, British Columbia, on the West Coast. And in fact, because it was near Hope, And because it offered them hope after being threatened by the mafia, they called the town Place of Hope, or PH for short. Where were the other secret communities? Well, of course, Stan didn't give details about precisely where they were located, but there was another up north in the Central Prairies, another in Nova Scotia, somewhere in Colchester County, and I believe there were a couple more. Pauline noted that when they'd moved across Canada, they had always been near one of these facilities. Stan told Pauline, I live in an apartment in officer's quarters. Some staff live in cedar cabins, you know, log houses. The people we pick up, the O, they live in cells. But it's a pretty humane prison. Stan described a compound, a village essentially, where people targeted by the mafia were stashed away for safety, with the criminals not far away. The prison, he said, was part of an underground penal system, entirely separated from the regular federal correctional system. It was reserved specifically for people arrested for and linked to organized crime. I live with the rest of the staff and I help run it, you replied. We call it the weird world. And so that's the weird world that the title of this episode refers to. It's the nickname for the whole secret Canadian anti-organized crime network, including its secret witness protection villages and prison system. Incidentally, regarding the latter, Stan said... A military tribunal, not within the regular justice system, tried the prisoners. It was overseen by the most senior military staff, its funding hidden within military budgets. Politically, only the Privy Council was aware of the existence of the weird world. It was weird in another way, too, Stan said. Its prisons and homes, its security and undercover work, were run with a philosophy radically different from any counterpart in the wider world. These guys, women too sometimes, aren't all just bad guys, Stan said. They were often victims themselves, he said, used and abused, suffering from addictions that were cruelly used to lure them into crime. They're the unloved, ignorant of any other kind of life. Apparently, they had a better than average rehabilitation success rate, especially with the lower level operatives who had been pressured into lives of organized crime. The staff of the weird world were people, he said, who wanted to create institutions where prisoners could be rehabilitated, offered counseling and psychological care, made whole. Some become new people. They're given new life. Like the organist, said Mom. They shared a smile. Who is the organist? It was Mom who answered. 
He was a black man who'd been picked up in Vancouver, part of a plot to grab Ted and me. Ted would have been in grade one, I in grade three, and Mom would have been working as Stan's secretary at the church. But he was another prisoner who had changed. Stan was nodding slowly. He earned our trust over many years. Now he's part of your coverage, protecting you. He puts himself in harm's way for you. I tried to remember if I'd ever seen a black man who might have been following me, watching me. No one came to mind. I silently vowed I'd be watching closely for him from now on. In my world, in the overwhelmingly white Anglo-Saxon city of St. John, he would be relatively easy to spot. He's called the organist because he learned to play the organ in the chapel at PH, Mom said. He still plays when he's inside, when he gets a furlough from covering you. Now that she had been briefed on the weird world, Pauline got a letter from the organist. He'd been a dentist, and he confirmed the story of how he'd once come after our family with instructions to grab Ted and me. He'd been picked up years before when we were still in Vancouver. He too apologized and told me how he'd found some peace and a happy life at PH, working outdoors, caring for animals, and building and repairing things. When I opened the first letter from the organist, Stan reminded me this man was sometimes part of my protection, my coverage. The organist told me he understood my life was difficult, stressful, but he said I was lucky to have people like Stan and Ruth who loved me. He wrote that that was something he'd never had as a child. And Pauline got letters from other people Stan knew in the weird world. Some of the staff at PH, whom I'd never met, wrote to say that they understood how terrified I must feel, how sorry they were that I had to live with that fear. They tried to reassure me that Stan and the others were doing everything they could to protect us. They called me Miss P, mostly. Someone who signed off as Lieutenant YCR wrote, P, it seems like only yesterday I sent you a small gift of moccasins. I remember those moccasins, their smell redolent of buckskin and fire smoke, soft with a fringe around the top and brightly beaded. They were under the Christmas tree the year before we left Vancouver, when I was nine. When I'd asked who they were from, Mom had said simply, A friend, someone you don't know. He's the boss inside, Stan said, interrupting the memory I was connecting to the letter before me. A wise man. He was a First Nations man who had risen in the ranks of the military and been tasked with building the anti-organized crime task force. He recruited me, Stan said. So Pauline got a letter, and as a girl, a gift of moccasins from the man who was charged with building the weird world and who had brought Stan into it after his counseling patient was killed and he himself was attacked. Now that Pauline knew about the weird world and the threats against her, did the kind of protection she got change in any way? Yes, now that she was aware of it, they could actually do more to protect her. For example, Stan asked if she would give permission to have a tracking device attached to her car so that the agents providing her coverage could follow her without having to get as close or be as obvious about what they were doing. And after thinking about it, she agreed. And they gave her a special device. Stan also gave me a small pocket transistor radio. This is in case you find yourself in trouble. He fixed me with an uncharacteristically stern look. You can use it to call for help, but it's only for life-threatening situations. If you use it, people will be prepared to put their lives at risk for yours. They'll come to you, but they may have to expose themselves to do it. Use it cautiously. It looked like any other pocket radio, the old-fashioned kind kids carried around in the 70s before iPods or even Walkmans. I felt an impulse to laugh as I imagined myself talking into the radio to unseen protectors. This is Agent 007. I pushed the thought away. Stan was explaining that the guys had modified it to be able to broadcast as well as receive. He showed me how to roll the volume dial to the maximum setting and the tuning dial to a specific frequency, and then flip the on switch to activate the broadcast function. I slipped it into my bag, where, even turned off, its presence broadcast a constant static of anxiety. I have a spy radio, I thought. I have the ability to muster security agents. I am under threat. A strange brew of power and dread. They also gave her a special phone number she could call if she was ever in trouble. Now that Pauline had been briefed on the weird world, did they let her brother Ted in on it? He was only two years younger than Pauline, so he was an adult now, too. Yeah, they eventually gave him a briefing also, and they gave him the same kind of information, gave him the same offers, gave him the same kind of emergency radio transmitter and the emergency phone number. How did Pauline react after her briefing? Well, in some ways, she was grateful to finally have an explanation for all the weird things that went on in her childhood. 
On the other hand, now she felt under threat. It created a lot of new stress for her, like we heard in how she felt about having the secret spy radio. Here's how she described the situation in an interview. You seemed to be a bit paranoid after that. You know, you yes. went home, you had this lovely bush in front of your house that you cut, uh, you cut down because you wanted to make sure no one was hiding. That's right. How did you deal with the news? Were you able to tell anybody? No. So that's, I was told, you can't tell anybody this story. And that you, you had a fiance at the time too. I did. Yeah, and you could be putting people at risk by telling them this. So yes, and, and I, I almost told him a couple of times, and then I didn't. And uh, so yeah, I felt very isolated. I went home to you know my life, uh, working as a reporter covering school board meetings and council meetings, and unable to talk about the thing that was really preoccupying me. And so I felt very isolated and increasingly paranoid because some of the stories that I'd been told were about uh, times that somebody had tried to poison somebody in the family. The new situation put a good bit of stress on her relationship with her fiance, Terry, and eventually the two split up. However, she found a new fiance, a man named Kevin. They eventually married and Stan stood in for her crime boss father, Warren, at the wedding and gave her away. She and Kevin had two daughters together. Kevin also was briefed about the weird world, but eventually their marriage broke up also. Did Pauline ever consider taking some of the stress off herself by going inside and living in one of the witness protection villages like Stan had? Yes, her mother Ruth was also planning on going inside, and Pauline was planning on going inside too. But there were hurdles that had to be cleared as they were key people in an organized crime investigation. Aside from bureaucratic paperwork that needed to be done, there were also aspects of the criminal investigation that needed to take place first. If they just suddenly vanished, that would be a signal to the mob that something was up. And so these aspects of the investigation took a very considerable amount of time to tie up. And it was while they were being taken care of that Pauline made a key discovery. She knew that Reverend Stan and her mother were people of extreme honesty. She thus concluded that they were not lying, and that's her position today, that they were not lying. Yet, Pauline learned that none of the things Reverend Stan and her mother told her about the weird world were true. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's big. All right, before we get to that, Let's take a moment and thank our patrons who make it possible for us to make this show and make it possible, including Father John R., Jordan P., Keith C., Ken K., and Luke E. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. All right, Jimmy, what theories are there about the weird world and all that happened to Pauline Dakin? We need to look at several questions. How did Pauline come to learn that what she was told wasn't true? Why did her mother and Stan, without lying, tell her all these false things? What implications did that have? How should we evaluate them from the faith perspective? And how has Pauline come to terms with all this? Okay, so from the reason perspective, what can we say about the weird world? How did Pauline come to learn that what she had been told wasn't true? Pauline was a journalist, and journalists are supposed to be skeptical, though too many of them aren't and just by a party line. <laughs> Pauline, however, had been trained to think through and critically examine things that she was being told. So right from the beginning, she considered the possibility that what her mom and Reverend Stan were saying about the weird world wasn't true. 
She initially decided that it was true. After all, both Stan and her mom had reputations as upstanding, truth-telling individuals. As we heard earlier, Stan stood up for causes because he felt they were right, and her mother was a proverbial stickler for truth. They were the two people she trusted most in life, and she decided that she couldn't imagine them lying to her. And even afterwards, she concluded they weren't. She decided that neither one of them had been lying about the weird world. Also, she'd been given evidence that seemed to confirm the existence of the weird world. Right. Her mother had been there when two men in a car tried to shoot her and Stan early on in Vancouver. Pauline remembered receiving the buckskin moccasins for Christmas in Vancouver and the Christmas oranges that appeared every year. When they were living in Winnipeg, Pauline heard the tremendous fight that her mother initially dismissed as the dog going crazy, but later said was an attempted murder. And Pauline received letters from the organist who apologized for trying to kidnap her and her brother when they were children, and a letter from the head of the Weird World program, and letters from others in the Weird World staff. So she had a bunch of evidence in favor of it. Nevertheless, as things progressed, she started having greater and greater doubts about whether what she had been told was the truth. And what caused the doubts? One of them started to grow in her mind after she received a message from inside the weird world. Her father, Warren, had had a previous family before he had married Ruth. You know, he was 15 years older than Ruth. And from that previous union, he had two children who were named Tom and Linda. They were Pauline and Ted's half-siblings. Pauline knew that her half-brother Tom lived in or near Vancouver because he regularly played golf with her full brother Ted, who was living there now. She also knew that her half-sister Linda had moved to the United States and was living in Oklahoma City. But then, at a certain point, she received letters from Tom and Linda indicating that they had gone inside and were living in weird world villages in Canada. But how could that happen? How could they be living in witness protection villages in Canada and simultaneously be living in public in Vancouver and Oklahoma City? It didn't make any sense. So she confronted Stan and said, These letters can't be real. And what was his response? He explained that not everyone was who they appeared to be. There were doubles that had been created, either by the organized crime families or by the secret Canadian task force that appeared to be someone else. The doubles were almost perfect. They had been surgically altered and trained to sound and behave as if they were someone who they weren't. As a result, it could be very difficult to tell a double from the person they were impersonating. And it has been the case that major political figures have used doubles to distract their opponents in history. These doubles, known as political decoys, have played a variety of roles, and we'll have a link to an article about political decoys. In the shaky Star Wars prequel, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, we see that former Queen Amidala is using a woman named Corday as her double and political decoy, and Corday gets killed for her efforts. Nevertheless, that's based on real-world things. As Pauline writes in her book, Run, Hide, Repeat, Winston Churchill famously had a double during the war, a political decoy. In the 1990s, an American undersecretary for the U.S. Army claimed other international leaders had doubles. Manuel Noriega, Fidel Castro, George W. Bush, Osama bin Laden, a doppelganger from the German literally double-goer, could be sent into particularly risky situations or used to distract from the actual movements of a world leader to draw eyes away during critical operations. And political doubles didn't just occur in World War II, as Pauline indicates. However, during the war, there were reports that Hitler used doubles, and I particularly love the way these rumors are treated in the 1942 propaganda film Hitler, Dead or Alive. In this film, a group of American mobsters go after Hitler. There's a, a reward for Hitler, Dead or Alive, and so the mob wants to get the reward, and so actually they're the good guys. And to prove that he's the real Adolf Hitler rather than a political decoy or duplicate, 
They've got to hold him down and shave off his mustache to reveal a telltale scar from years before. <laughs> so we'll have a link to where you can watch Hitler Dead or Alive with all of its mustache shaving glory. <laughs> Great to see Hitler humiliated that way. Yes, it's awesome. Shave off that little thing. <laughs> However, uh, while it would make sense for powerful political leaders to use political decoys or doubles, it makes a lot less sense for this to happen with organized crime figures and the witnesses of organized crime operations. At least, it doesn't make sense to go to the effort of having virtually indistinguishable doubles that can withstand up-close, face-to-face scrutiny by the people who knew them. I mean, with all the makeup and plastic surgery and the memory, voice, and mannerism training that that would involve. So this contributed to Pauline's doubts, but she didn't yet conclude that everything she had been told was false. Did her brother Ted ever have doubts after he was briefed on the weird world? Yes, Ted had been given an emergency radio just like Pauline had, and he once tried to use it when he thought he and his wife Elaine were in danger. They were living in the lower apartment of a house when Stan called to warn them, telling them to be sure to lock their doors and windows. In careful language, signaling his worry that the phone line might be bugged, he said he had word that something was brewing and someone might be coming after them. On one of the following nights, Ted heard a noise at the back of the house. He thought someone was breaking in. In light of Stan's warning, he decided the situation justified the use of the radio Stan had given him to call for help. He set the dials in the way he'd been shown and, feeling ridiculous, spoke into the back of the device. He explained the situation and then waited for the cavalry to come. Nothing happened. More sounds came from the back of the house. Still no help arrived. Eventually, Ted decided to take matters into his own hands. He found his baseball bat and slammed out the side door, yelling and swinging. It was nothing, he said later. Maybe someone had been there and ran away. Maybe it was a raccoon or a cat rattling around in the garbage cans. But at times, you thought you were going to have to fight for your life, he recalls now. Later, when he asked why no one had responded to his radio call for help, Stan took the device away for inspection. Word came back and it malfunctioned. It might have gotten wet. Ted also had been given the secret emergency phone number to call, and he ended up using that too. Another night, driving through the darkness of Stanley Park's old-growth forest, Ted and Elaine again thought they were being followed. No matter which turn they took, whether they drove slow or fast, the dark sedan remained determinedly behind them. Ted didn't have the radio, which he no longer trusted anyway, but he had the secret phone number Stan had given him as a backup. These being the days before cell phones, he drove to a brightly lit payphone on a busy street and dialed as the sedan drove slowly by. The number was out of service. By the time he got back in his car, the sedan had disappeared. There were investigations and explanations for the, these failures. The radio malfunction, the emergency phone line had mistakenly been cut off, Stan said. But for Ted, it was too late for excuses. He was done with the weird world. His worry had shifted to mom and how she was being manipulated. So now Ted was done with the weird world, but Pauline hadn't decided yet. She was still struggling with her doubts, torn between the love and trust she had for Ruth and Stan, but also seeing the problems with what they had told her. What finally convinced Pauline that what she had been told about the weird world wasn't true? In 1993, more than five years after she learned about the weird world, Pauline decided to put it to a test. I decided to set a trap, conduct a sting. I thought carefully about what I could do to make the results clear and undeniable. I waited for a time when I knew Stan was visiting Mom, when I could get an immediate response from him, and then I put my plan into action. I staged a break-in at our house, pulling the cabinet with the television and other electronics out from the wall, opening drawers and cupboard doors, leaving the front door ajar. I don't know why I bothered physically setting the scene. No one would see it. Perhaps it was how I worked myself up to committing what felt like a treacherous act. My own lie intended to deceive and entrap. I was turning the tables. I felt the momentousness of my action, and I was aware that this could forever change or even end my relationship with Stan, maybe even with my mother. As a result, my heart was beating hard, my breath catching in my throat, as if I had really come upon a break-in when I dialed Mom's number. Mom, I started. Immediately, she knew something was wrong. What is it? 
She was always primed for disaster, and I could hear in her voice she was bracing to hear the worst. That was the inheritance of decades spent on the run, being told your life and your children's are always at risk. Someone has broken into the house, I said shakily. I described the scene, and I said I couldn't see anything missing. Should I call the police? Are you sure there's still no one there? Yes. Let me talk to our friend, and I'll call you right back. I knew that Stan, our friend, would process the information and send a coded message to his intelligence people, who would question my undercover man, who was supposedly sitting in a car down the street or around the corner from my house, and wait for a coded response, tapped out and received in his butt receiver. Sure, I imagined him at mom's table deciphering the code with letters and strokes into his notebook, and her watching and anxiously waiting for the reply. It came quickly. I looked at my phone as it rang, feeling unprepared for what I might hear, even as I desperately wanted to know the results of my test. This was the moment of truth I'd craved. And now that the phone was ringing, I had to force myself to answer it. It was mom. She said she couldn't talk on the phone and that I should come to her place that evening. Don't delay. Two hours later, Pauline arrived at her mother's house and Stan explained what he had been told by his associates in the weird world. It was two guys who broke in, Stan began. I watched his mouth moving and wondered if he or mom could see any signs of the cataclysmic shifting happening within me in reaction to those words, the confirmation of Stan's deception. I thought I'd feel relieved to know for sure. I thought the worst thing would have been if he'd said no. There was no mafia involvement in the break-in. We know nothing about it. You'd better call the police. Then I would have been faced with uncertainty, a failed test with no definitive results. But now I had my answer and wasn't feeling relief. I was feeling horror and white-hot anger and profound sadness. And even though it was the expected outcome, utter disbelief. None of it was real. He was making it up. This was the proof, the evidence that I could not deny that I must act on. I was now deaf to him as he spoke, my attention focused inward to scenes and memories unfurling in rapid progression. All the moves and disappearances, all the running, all the sick, terrifying stories, all the upheaval, all the isolation, it was all because of a lie. A lie! All made up. All the layered creation of the brilliant, twisted imagination of this man, whom I'd chosen to love and trust as a father. I was shattered a flurry of innumerable jagged little pieces coming apart. He said mobsters had been picked up in my neighborhood shortly after I had discovered and called about the break-in. Photographs of me had been found in the back of their car. They'd been watching me. Once, this would have frightened me. Now I wondered at Stan's ability to make up these creepy details designed to terrorize me. Why? What do they want? I asked, not looking at him, my eyes on the floor. He said they were looking for all the China my father had been sending me over the years. Why the China? He said information and the names of mafia contacts had been written in invisible ink on the backs of the plates. Their instructions had been to use ultraviolet light to reveal and copy the information. He said sensitive information was often hidden with innocent people for later retrieval, so that implicating evidence couldn't be tied to kingpins like my dad if their homes were raided. How could I ever have believed this crap? I wondered silently. Our guys are in your house now, cleaning up the china. There won't be any writing left on it by the time you get home tomorrow. So Pauline had the proof that the weird world was fake, and Stan was making it all up. Now that she knew the truth, what did she do? She didn't confront them immediately. She was too overwhelmed and wanted to think, so she spent the night at, in her mother's spare room. Eventually, she did confront her mother with what she had done, but her mother's belief in the weird world was unshaken. So Pauline confronted Stan. His reply was that something must have gone wrong, that perhaps there'd been some kind of betrayal within the ranks of the weird world that could explain the flawed response to my test. He said he'd have to investigate. He warned me of the danger I could be in, how I still needed the protection of my coverage, the guys who had so many times put their lives in jeopardy to successfully prevent harm from coming to me. But like her brother Ted, Pauline was now definitively done with the weird world and no longer believed in it. All right, let me ask the next major question I've been dying to ask. Why did Pauline's mother and Reverend Sears tell her so many things that weren't true? And without lying, 
it's a complex question, and I can tell you the conclusions that Pauline came to in later years. To answer the question, we need to break it in half and deal first with why Pauline's mother told her all these things, and then we can look at why Stan did. The basic conclusion that Pauline comes to in her book is that her mother told her all these things because she really believed them, and she was not lying. She concludes that her mother had a psychological condition known as folie à deux, which is French for madness for two. In English, it's often called shared delusional disorder. It's thought to happen when a person with a strong personality, that would be Stan in this case, develops a delusion and then shares it with those around him, such as his wife Sybil, Ruth, and Pauline and Ted. There are different types of shared delusional disorder. They are sometimes classified by the nature of the delusion or false belief that they involve. A bizarre delusion is said to be one that is really, really far out, like the idea that all of your internal organs have been taken out and replaced with somebody else's internal organs. A non-bizarre delusion is one that's very unlikely, but is at least possible, such as the idea that you're being followed around and sent messages by government agencies and organized crime. So by that standard, Ruth's delusions about the weird world would fall in th on the non-bizarre side of the spectrum. So Pauline thought she had an explanation for why her mother told her all the things she did. She'd become a victim of folie adieu after she became a counseling patient and friend of Stan while she was a vulnerable, newly divorced single mom. And what do you make of that? I think that Ruth was definitely an innocent victim here and that Stan was the source of her false beliefs about the weird world, but I'm a little cautious about chalking it up to mental illness. Lots of people have false beliefs. In fact, everybody has false beliefs about something, but we shouldn't simply attribute those to mental illness. There's the old computer saying, garbage in, garbage out. If you're fed a lot of bad data, you will come to incorrect conclusions, and you don't need to appeal to mental illness and pathologize someone to explain that. Ruth had been fed a lot of bad data. She had seen men chasing her and Stan in a car and point gun at, a gun at them. She had heard the fight when they stayed at the Sears's in Winnipeg. She had received numerous letters from people inside the weird world, and her children had received Christmas presents from these people. Given all the eyewitness, earwitness, and physical evidence, it's not that unreasonable to believe one of your closest friends when he says there's a classified anti-organized crime task force and you've gotten caught in the conflict between it and its targets. At least, it's not unreasonable to believe that initially. Now, it's possible that Ruth did have psychological predispositions or even a form of mental illness that contributed to her belief in the weird world, I'm just saying that we need to be careful about automatically pathologizing people just because they believe something that isn't true. A lot of time, it's just garbage in, garbage out, and we shouldn't automatically assume it's a form of mental illness. And what about Stan? What did Pauline conclude about him? It took longer for her to figure out a diagnosis for Stan. Why would Stan lie? Well, that was the question, you know, because Stan was a good person. Uh, in every respect that you would measure by. You called him Papa. I called him Papa, yeah. And, you know, people really regarded him as a good person and respected him, and why would he make this crazy thing up? And so I just thought that I was going to have to live with that question for the rest of my life and not know the answer. She even consulted a doctor to try to figure out what might be wrong with Stan. I went to see a psychiatrist to say, okay, tell me, what the heck could be going on here? What would explain this behavior? And, you know, because he was clearly not psychotic or, or schizophrenic or any of the other major mental illnesses that is, you know, associated with delusion. And I just did not believe that he was... A bad person? A bad person, you know, trying to hurt us for some unexplained reason. And this or psychiatrist really didn't have a good explanation. He, uh, he said, for the, you know, that my mother could have been caught up in a delusion that this guy had... Uh, because of something they call folly adieu, which is where 
you know, a strong, compelling personality such as, you know, Stan had uh, can sometimes kind of pull uh, somebody else into a delusion and, and they will believe it. And there are all kinds of stories about that in the literature. So Pauline didn't have a good explanation for Stan's behavior. Until one day I was reading a medical journal article and it was about something called delusional disorder. And as I read it, all the bells went off and I thought, this is Stan. This is exactly what he looks like. People with delusional disorder can be very highly functioning and outwardly appear entirely normal. They're able to hold down jobs, keep families together, and they're not, you know, constantly having marked hallucinations or things like that. But they have false beliefs of one type or another. This condition is rarely reported, something like 27 out of every 100,000 people, or about 0.0003% of people are thought to have it. But it's also thought that it may be quite a bit higher than that, because the people who have it don't realize that they do, and if they're high-functioning people who outwardly seem normal, they don't get diagnosed, because they're just seeming to be normal people living their lives. As before, there are different subtypes based on the delusions a person has. One subtype is a romantic delusion, where a person may think that a famous person is secretly in love with them and sending them messages. When I was in high school, the mother of one of my friends actually had that. Uh, she thought that Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones was secretly in love with her. Sometimes a person exhibits delusions from more than one category. These are known as mixed type cases, that, and that would seem to be the case with Stan. His delusions involved being persecuted by organized crime, but they also involved a grandiose understanding of himself as a prominent person who was helping run the weird world. Eventually, after Pauline encountered the concept of delusional disorder, she talked to some psychological professionals about it and even interviewed one of the major experts on the disorder. Stan was dead by that point, so he couldn't be given a psychological evaluation, but they agreed that the behavior he displayed seemed most consistent with delusional disorder. What do you make of that diagnosis? I have mixed thoughts about it. I recognize that Stan displayed behaviors that could lead him to be diagnosed with delusional disorder, but I think more work needs to be done to sharpen its diagnostic criteria. In particular, I think more work needs to be done to clarify what a delusion is. Not every false belief is a delusion, and we need a good objective way to say what a delusion is if you're going to be claiming to objectively diagnose people with delusional disorder. Unfortunately, there is a debate in the psychological community about how to define the concept of a delusion, and I don't think we have a good definition for it yet. At least, I haven't seen one. On the other hand, if Stan believed what he said about the weird world, then in his case, I think it had to go beyond mere garbage in, garbage out, and his beliefs would be fundamentally tied to a disordered thought process or mental illness. If Pauline's mother was honest but mistaken about the weird world, what about Stan? Was his mental illness fully responsible for what he said? Or do you have reason to doubt Stan's sincerity? I'm torn on this one, and the reason has to do with the eye, ear, and physical evidence that Ruth and Pauline were given about the weird world. I mean, for example, how can we explain the two men who chased Stan and Ruth in a car and pointed a gun at them? In her book, Pauline speculates that Stan may have enlisted Confederates, paid actors, to do this. However, I don't think that's necessary. It could have just been an attempted robbery that happened to them by chance, and then Stan was able to get them out of it, but his delusion caused him to interpret it as a mob hit. Similarly, concerning the fight that Pauline heard when they were staying in Winnipeg, in her book, she speculates that that also might have involved Confederates, but again, it could have been any number of things, including the dog going crazy or Stan himself going crazy, and it got interpreted through the lens of Stan's delusions about the weird world. 
What about the physical things they got from the weird world, like the moccasins, Christmas oranges, the medicine when Stan didn't recognize Pauline, and all the letters? Some of these could be explained in terms of Stan's delusions. For example, he might have thought that he received messages over his pocket receiver that told him to buy moccasins or Christmas oranges or a certain type of pill, and he would then just be delivering these things on behalf of the people in the weird world. You know, so he he could have deluded himself about that. The hardest thing to explain are the or the hardest things are the letters. In her book, Pauline thinks that Stan typed or wrote all the letters by himself, and I'm sure she's right. My question is, what was Stan thinking when he wrote them? I mean, I guess it's hypothetically possible that he thought he was receiving messages on his pocket receiver, which he then decoded and wrote down or typed for the people in the weird world, imitating their penmanship in the case of the written ones. It's even possible that he thought he was receiving these message, messages telepathically and wrote them down. He just never told Ruth or Pauline about the telepathy. So I guess it's possible that he thought he was merely serving as the agent of the people in the weird world when he was fabricating these letters. But I also think it's possible he knew he was fabricating them. In that case, my question would be, how often did he have this level of clarity? It could be that the clarity was just momentary, in which case he might still believe in the weird weird world and interpret his fabrication of the letters as something he was doing to reinforce the beliefs of others as a way of helping them so they would be safe. Or it could be that he always had the level of clarity that he did when he was fabricating the letters, in which case it's harder to imagine him sincerely believing in the weird world. In that case, he might just be a liar, or partially just a liar, rather than a genuinely delusional person. What about his pocket receiver? He didn't really have one, so could that be evidence he was just lying? Sure, but not necessarily. It could be that he did have a physical object in his pocket, in his wallet. It could have even just been a credit card that he delusionally believed would vibrate and send him messages. So I don't see the pocket receiver as providing major evidence here. You know, it, today when we have phones that do vibrate, sometimes if you carry one around in your pocket, you'll have phantom vibrations when your phone's not really vibrating. So the mind can definitely conjure, oh, I've got something in my pocket vibrating when it's not. Is there any other major evidence that could point to Stan just being a liar? There is one thing. Stan said that he had moved away from his wife when he went inside and started living in the non-existent town he called Place of Hope. But Pauline later learned from Stan's family that he'd been living with his wife the entire time. So Stan was living on a day-to-day basis with two facts that conflicted with the narrative he gave Ruth. He really was living with his wife, and he really wasn't living in the fictional place of hope. If he was aware of those two facts, then he had a fairly constant level of clarity that could support the idea he was lying to Ruth and her family and his wife because he'd convinced her of the weird world too. Also, all of the delays that Ruth and Pauline had that kept them from going inside to live at Place of Hope, those could have been, you know, the things that Stan said were due to paperwork and the task force needing to finish certain investigations. All of those delays could indicate that Stan had clarity about the fact these women were never going to go inside and live at Place of Hope, which would again support the idea that he was lying. How would you argue the other side of the case, that he really did have delusions and wasn't simply a liar? Well, first of all, I can imagine ways that he might not have realized the truth about his daily living situation. In psychology, there's a condition, and it gets pronounced differently. Uh, It's pronounced sometimes Capgras syndrome or Capgras syndrome. And it's where you believe that the people around you have been replaced and are actually imposters, kind of like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Given that Stan claimed various people had doubles, 
that had been supplied either by the people who ran the Weird World or by organized crime, it's possible that he thought his wife, the woman he was living with, was one of the doubles. Maybe he thought that the Weird World had provided him with a double of his wife for some reason. And maybe he thought whatever town he was living in was really place of hope, but that it had been dressed up to look like a different town as part of its security measures or something. And if he were just a liar, what would Stan's motive be for deceiving both his wife and Ruth and everybody else about the weird world? I can imagine a sociopath who lacks empathy for others or even just a practical joker scaring people with crazy stories like this for a short time. But by all reports, Stan was not a sociopath. He was very compassionate. And what motive would he have to keep up the pretense and all the psychological stress and fear it caused for years? All of that would seem to suggest that Stan really was sincere about the weird world. So I'm not sure what to think. There's evidence that at least part of what Stan was doing was conscious manipulation of others, but there's also evidence that points the other way. Perhaps the truth is a mix of both, that he was partially sincere, but also sometimes consciously lying. By the way, as listeners know, I strive for accuracy in the material we present, so I ran the scripts for these two episodes past a psychiatrist, one of the mysterious irregulars named Dr. Joseph Sheridan, and asked what he thought of my take on the psychological aspects of the case. Here's what he had to say. This is certainly a most interesting and mysterious case indeed. To answer your primary question, in essence, yes, I would say that everything that you've written in terms of the psychological aspects of the case makes sense, and there's nothing incorrect in your descriptions of the psychological terms. You could put this on the air as is, and any mental health professional would say, well done. These are just some of my side thoughts. You asked if perhaps Pauline's mother, Ruth, may have had a mental illness herself, which would argue against the theory that she was the secondary party in a case of fully ado. Based on everything written about her, it does not sound like there was any delusional illness on her part. Pauline seems like quite an observant person, and she made no mention of observing any signs of delusions in her mother prior to meeting Stan. Also, in my experience, during divorce and custody proceedings, if one parent shows even a hint of a mental illness, the other parent will try to use this in their favor in the custody battle, and there was no reference to this in your writings. To me, the biggest question here as a psychiatrist, is definitely what you had discussed. Was Stan just a pathetic man, completely enslaved by his paranoid delusions, or was he a master manipulator, engaging in an ultra-extreme form of gaslighting? Or, as you mentioned, was there a component of both? I think one could make a very strong argument for all cases. Normally, people who have delusional disorders, especially paranoid type, have delusions that revolve around themselves only or their immediate family. It would be very unusual for someone to develop such an elaborate set of delusions that primarily involved another family. But if Stan was just a master manipulator, what was it that he had to gain? Sociopaths manipulate others for their own gain, financial, sexual, etc. But it did not appear that Stan had anything to gain based on the story as it is written. Weird world indeed. So some very interesting thoughts from Dr. Sheridan. So, Jimmy, what can we say about the weird world from the faith perspective? There's not a lot. Obviously, lying is a bad thing, and there's no justification for any of the falsehoods that were told in this case, with the possible exception of the test that Pauline staged to expose the truth. And whether you find that justified will depend on your theory of lying and whether it's ever permissible. Also, obviously, mental illness is a tragedy, and we need to do what we can to help the people who have it. And even when a person has false beliefs that aren't due to mental illness, we need to do what we can to help them use critical thinking and see the truth. Let's talk about the aftermath of Pauline's discovery. Did she ever convince her mother or Stan that the weird world wasn't real? No, both her mother and Stan went to their graves maintaining that the weird world was real, and so did Stan's wife, Sybil. How was Pauline able to come to terms with all of this? 
it took her some time to come down from the state of fear that she had been placed in even after she learned the truth. Here's part of an interview she gave where she talks about the impact this all had on her. You've lost a lot in this process, have you not? Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah. So my brother and I essentially lost our relationships, at least for a very long time, with our dad and with our extended family. Uh, and, you know, every time we moved, you would lose all those friends and relationships. So a lot of severed relationships. But even personally, because you're always, you know, how do you know who to trust? Um, always living like, you know, people are following us. How do you feel safe? Yes, yes. So, yeah, that was very difficult for a long time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the discovery that it wasn't true uh, began a process for me where I had to, you know, just t talk to myself every time. I remember being in a Tim Hortons one time and a Mountie walked in and then a few minutes later another walked in and then I look up and there's four of them there and I'm thinking, something's going on. And it's like, no. You know, they're, they're having coffee. Mm. <laughs> so I had to sort of, for a while, talk myself down from that high alert feeling of watching over your shoulder. I don't feel that anymore at all. So I, I feel as though I now successfully live as though, you know, none of that was real. Needless to say, for a long time, she was very angry, particularly at Stan, about what had happened to her and her family and the way Stan's falsehoods affected both her childhood and her adult life. Were you angry? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was angry for years after that. You know, I confronted first my mother and said, it's not real. You know, here's the evidence. And she she was horrified but not for the reason I expected. She was horrified because she was worried that, oh no, if, if she doesn't believe this, she'll put herself in danger. I only saw Stan uh, another time or two after that. And it, naturally, nothing was ever the same. Uh, and my mother and I were kind of at war. We didn't want to let go of each other, but I would try to convince her it was all a hoax and she would try to convince me it was real. It and changed we, the relationship. It changed the relationship, yeah. But more recently, she's come to peace with it. And you've, you've forgiven Stan? Yes. Uh, I, you know, my, my feelings around Stan are still kind of complex. But yes, I, I don't feel that he was trying to harm my family anymore. And so that helps. I have, in, in the case of my mother, you know, writing about our story and writing about her and her, what her life was even before all of this began, uh, I really felt as though I got to know her in a different way, and I feel a huge empathy for her. And, uh, you know, what a difficult life she had. And, and yes, I've completely forgiven my mom. Now, having written the book and looking back, um, what do you think is the biggest lesson that you've taken from this experience? I, I think from the perspective of a mature person now, what I take away is I'm okay after living this very traumatic life, ironically, because of the kind of mother I had. So yes, she put us in these chaotic situations that were very difficult, but there was never a time, and my brother would say this too, there was never a time that either one of us questioned that she loved us, that she supported us, uh, that she was proud of us. And I think when you look at the research around resilience and what gives people resilience to get through difficult things, mm -hmm. having that key adult who's always got your back uh, and makes you feel part of something and, and loved is so important. Uh, so I benefited from that. Thank you so much for writing this and showing us mm -hmm. that forgiveness is possible even after something mm -hmm. this difficult. Thanks for your interest. It's, it's been nice to talk to you. And to you. Jimmy, what's your bottom line of this amazing and tragic story? Pauline Dakin has an amazing life story. She went through a lot that was completely inexplicable to her as a child. Then as an adult, she was given an explanation that made sense of these things, but then introduced her to a new world of stress and fear. Over time, her own perseverance helped her learn the truth about what she'd been told, and in the end, she forgave her mom and was even able to forgive Stan. The interpretation she offers in her book of these events involves delusional disorder and shared delusional disorder, or folia due. I think that these are possible explanations, but the concepts need to be probed, clarified, and further researched. 
All told, Pauline Dakin was a very resilient individual in the face of everything that she faced. As you heard, she credits her mother for helping her develop that resilience because her mother always had her back. Jimmy, what further resources do we want to offer the listener on this subject? We'll have a link to Pauline's book, Run, Hide, Repeat, which is a fascinating read and obviously goes into a lot more detail than we could hear. Uh, We'll have an interview with Pauline that you can watch. We'll have information about the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, political decoys or doubles, the 1942 film Hitler, Dead or Alive, information about folie adieu, delusional disorder, and Capgras delusion. All right. So, as promised, here's our mysterious feedback on Drop Bears. Our first feedback was some audio feedback from Matthew that he sent in via email. I knew it, you guys, from the second I saw that title on your podcast list. I'm like, Drop Bears are not real. And then I was impressed with how far you went with this hoax. Even getting Matt Frad on the show, being like, oh yeah, if I saw a Drop Bear, I would run the other way. Anyway, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. I'm supporting your show through Patreon. Please keep doing what you're doing. And thank you very much, Matthew. We always appreciate feedback, including audio feedback, so we can let the listeners hear it in the listener's own voice. Glad you enjoyed the episode. I really did appreciate Matt Frad and the Catholics of Oz coming on, and we had a lot of really positive feedback about the show. It was it was awesome. It was really great. So uh, and then Mary wrote on feedback on Facebook, not on feedback on Facebook. This was perhaps the best April Fool's post ever. But what else would I expect from Jimmy Aiken and Dom? I expected you and Dom to shout April Fool at the end. Yeah, that's kind of a tradition, but I prefer to be a little bit more subtle about it and just note casually that, oh, yeah, we're releasing this on April 1st. <laughs> it, that way it'll. Hopefully, if they have, if listeners haven't caught on by that point, that it'll let them know, but without the April Fools thing that could, you know, make them feel a little bad. I don't want to yeah. make people feel bad. Right. Uh, Grand Inquisitor wrote on YouTube, "Man, I was Rick rolled by Jimmy Aiken." Yeah, and that's a tradition in the April Fools episode we do. I'll always have in the further resources a link to a really disturbing video that I don't otherwise describe, but that <laughs> is a Rick roll. That way you'll always know, folks. Uh, Richard wrote on Facebook, when you've waited a year for a new April Fool episode, then sit patiently through it, becoming gradually convinced that it's real, only to find you've been had. Nice work, boys. Thank you, Richard. Jessica wrote on Facebook, the one thing I dislike on these episodes, the questions on the things surrounding the main story. Did Jimmy really have a toy koala? Did he buy it himself? And was it rabbit fur? Yes, all of those things are true. And actually, the way I write the April Fool's episodes, at least the way I've done it every year so far, everything I say is technically true. So I'm not lying at all in these April Fool's episodes. I am telling the truth in everything I say. I go over the script again more than once to make sure that everything I say is true. So if I say it's reported on the Australian Museum's website that this is the case about drop bears. That's true. There is a page on the Australian Museum's website about drop bears that says exactly what I attribute to it. So the April Fool's episodes are really critical thinking demonstrations, at least in hindsight, so that you can go back over them and listen and hear how even truth presented a certain way can be very misleading. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an object lesson. I I want them to have re-listen value in that you can go back over once you know the joke and say, oh, I see how that's technically true. And and it can build critical thinking skills for other situations. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I had a toy koala. I did buy it. It was made of rabbit fur, all that. In fact, on the Facebook thread where you commented this, Jessica, someone else had a similar toy koala is so similar that it's pro- my guess is it was made by the same manufacturer is from the same line and they posted a picture of it there so you can actually see what it looked like. Ben Kner on Facebook writes, "You didn't get me this year because you got me so good last year. I even knew it was April first, but I was gushing to my husband about the amazing gemstone rains I had never heard of, especially since I didn't finish the episode in one sitting." 
My baby, who has serious health issues, had just been diagnosed at that time, and I remember it very fondly as a major laugh and source of comfort during a very difficult time. We love you, Jimmy and Dom. Well, thank you, Brenna, and we're so glad that it provided that comfort to you, and we'll encourage uh, listeners to pray for your baby and that your baby's health issues will be able to be successfully addressed. Another thing, though, like we just said to Jessica, everything I say in the April Fool's episodes is true. So there really are amazing gemstone rains on these other planets that we talked about, at least according to our best scientific understanding. So those the, those those are true as far as we can tell. And if you go back into the further resources, we'll have links to articles on science websites about them. So you can check that out. But by the way, she's referring to last year's a government acid conspiracy April Fool's episode. Right. Uh, Jeremy writes on YouTube, As an Australian, I was listening to this wondering if maybe some Australian scientists had published studies in order to troll the rest of the world. Then I realized what day it was. Well, Jeremy, they did. That's what enabled me to do the episode and quote from these Australian journals because there really were Australian scientists who decided to prank everybody and uh, wrote, write journal articles about drop bears. So all I had to do was say, according to this journal article, this is the case. And I was technically telling the truth. It's like they have a national uh, a personality quirk of uh, having a really good sense of humor in Australia. I have to yeah. agree. Uh, History and moral philosophy on YouTube writes, not this year, Aiken. I already knew about the drop bear. Yeah, and I knew some people would already be in on the joke. That was something, because this was this one is popular enough that I was a little concerned about how many people are going to know about this one already. But it turned out that a lot of people really enjoyed it anyway. Lola, 1984, on YouTube, wrote, Jimmy Aiken, you have totally destroyed the best practical joke ever. Not going to be able to use it on any tourist anymore. Yeah, and she's got a little crying face emoji there. <laughs> um, actually, take heart, Lola. While Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is popular and we have something like... 60,000 listeners per episode now, you still got 7 billion more you can prank. So take <laughs> heart. Right. Charbel on Facebook wrote, I'm ashamed to say that you even fooled me, an Aussie who was in on the joke and actually began to fall for it midway. Great episode. Thank you, Charbel. That is high, that is high compliments. Yes. Uh, Credo DM on YouTube wrote, I really like how you slow walked the claims and evidence that as the show went on, the claims and evidence incrementally got more ridiculous. By the time you got to Drop Bears targeting blonde female foreigners and Vegemite, I was giggling uncontrollably. Well done, Jimmy, Dom, and your Aussie friends. Thank you, Credo DM. Yeah, I think consciously about the storytelling structure, and in an April Fool's episode, definitely we're going to start with the most believable stuff and then save the least believable stuff for the end. So you have this gradual increase in the unbelievability of the evidence so that people have it dawn on them at different points in the episode that this is just April Fool's. And um, for a lot of people, they commented on the drop bears targeting the blonde females and, and using Vegemite to defend yourself <laughs> as the thing yeah. that tipped it for them. One person, I, I and I tried to find his message and I couldn't, commented on the very last thing, which was that the way to detect a drop if a drop bear is in the tree above you is to lie on the ground and spit into the air and if a drop bear is in the tree he will spit back <laughs> and and that was like the eye-opening moment or at least yeah. was very much appreciated because <laughs> yeah. e either there's a drop bear in the tree or we're living on a planet with gravity <laughs> right. i gotta tell you at times when i'm when we're doing these episodes it's a real hard thing to not laugh and give it away as we're doing this i sometimes have to turn off my microphone all right, and then our last uh, uh, feedback comes from Whitney, who sent an email. Okay, y'all got me good. I got through half of the Drop Air episode before I realized y'all were pranking us. I will be becoming a patron after this episode. Just take my money. I've been encouraging my husband to finish the episode, but he's still not finished listening to it. I'm dying to hear when he figures it's a prank. Well, Whitney, thank you so much for your generosity. We really uh, depend on listeners like you to make the show possible. And I hope your husband enjoyed it when he did realize that it was a prank. <laughs> All right. And so, Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? 
Well, since we were talking about an Australian cryptid, the drop bear, I thought we'd have an Australia and cryptids theme this week. In a previous episode, we talked about Somerton Man, the mysterious man who died on a beach in Somerton, uh, Australia, and who may have been a spy. For all we know, there have been ongoing efforts to identify him, and now he has been exhumed so that we could get some, hopefully get some DNA and then do family tracing with the DNA to look to figure out who he might be. The same way we caught the Golden State Killer, even though this person's DNA is not on file. If we can get his DNA, we can then find out what family he's from, and that can help identify him. So that is underway, and we'll have a link to a story about that. Also, we mentioned that a, you know, a cryptid is an animal that is not presently known to exist. And there have been cases, like we talked about a sand octopus uh, recently from Latin America that was recently discovered. It, it's not an octopus that lives in a desert. It's an octopus that hides in sand underwater, but it's called a sand octopus. It had been rediscovered. We talked about that a few episodes ago. Another animal that has been rediscovered to exist is a giant tortoise that was previously thought extinct. People thought it had gone extinct like in 1906, but it turns out, nope, we found it again. So there are animals out there that we haven't known about. The search is continuing for one of the animals we talked about in the Drop Bear episode, known as the Tasmanian tiger or the Tasmanian wolf or the thylacine. It's a kind of marsupial animal. It looks kind of like a wolf, but it's also got stripes on its hindquarters, kind of like a tiger, so it has these different names. It lived into the 20th century. We even had them in zoos, and you can watch footage of them that were taken in captivity. But it is not known to presently exist, but there continue to be reports of Tasmanian tigers being seen out there. And so we'll have a link to a little short video on YouTube about the continuing search for the Tasmanian tiger. Awesome. Jimmy, anything left to say in this episode before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you to Melanie for being, uh, your wife Melanie, Dom, for being a principal reader in this episode. Yes, thank you very much, Melanie. All right, so that does it from us. So what are your theories? We want to hear from you. What are your theories about Pauline Dakin and the weird world? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next time, we're going to be doing a local story based here in San Diego, and we're going to be telling the haunting story of Luis Santiago, the Border Patrol ghost. Ooh, interesting. Folks, remember to like this episode on the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, retweet it on Twitter, share it with your friends, let everyone know about these very interesting stories that we're sharing. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>